Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those he favors. Thank you again for joining us on this Christmas Eve. Uh, tonight, for just a few moments, I'd like to look at uh, the Christmas story through Mary's eyes, through the eyes of Mary. Now, one of the things that's interesting as you look back over the Old Testament is how often God speaks to His people. If you read through the whole Old Testament, you'll discover that over 1,900 times God specifically speaks to His people over and over again. God reminds His people of how much He loves them. He teaches them how they are supposed to live. He rebukes them when they, when they get out of line. In fact, one phrase alone, thus saith the Lord, is repeated over 1,500 times in the Old Testament. But all of that changes with Malachi. Malachi is the last prophet in the Old Testament. And uh, he was the last one that God used to, to speak directly to his people. From Malachi to the dawn of the New Testament, 400 years pass. And during that 400-year period of time, there's no new word from God. There's no fresh word. There's no, thus saith the Lord. From Abraham to Malachi, there's about a thousand years that pass, but now for 400 years, God has gone silent. Now, 400 years is about the, the, the amount of time that the United States has been a country. So that gives you a picture. It's a long, long time. But even though uh, God had stopped speaking to his people, they still went through the motions of their faith. They still sacrificed. They still burned incense. They still offered prayers. But since they had stopped hearing a fresh new word from God, I'm certain that the, the sense of God's presence must have diminished. The longer God remained silent, the less they probably thought that he cared. Everything that they knew about God was from voices that had come centuries earlier. No fresh word from God, no present reminder that he loved them, that he still cared, nothing but silence. And that's what makes Zechariah's appearance in Scripture in the New Testament so shocking. 
We read in Luke chapter 1 that uh, Zechariah was righteous in God's sight. He was, he was upright. He observed the Lord's commandments blamelessly and his, his wife as well. But even though they had spent their entire lives trying to please God, things hadn't worked out like they had imagined. The Bible tells us that Zechariah and Elizabeth were well along in years and barren. Now, to not have children in that culture, well, it, it was considered shameful. Children were viewed as God's blessing. The more children you had, the more blessed you were. To not have children meant you were suspect. Maybe you had sinned. Maybe you had done something wrong. And for that reason, God had held back his blessing. Well, one day, while Zechariah was serving in the temple, according to the custom of this day, he was alone inside while everybody was outside praying and worshiping. Then something happened that had not happened in four years. Hundred years. An angel appeared to Zechariah. Now, again, this hadn't happened for centuries. Zechariah had read about angels in the Old Testament, and he knew that God spoke to his people historically, but he had never experienced it personally. And as a result, we read in Luke when Zechariah saw him, when he saw the angel, he was startled. And gripped with fear, with good reason. He'd never heard the, Lord, the Lord's voice uh, personally. He'd never seen an angel before. Then the angel, Gabriel, tells Zechariah news that would have been absolutely breathtaking to him. Remember, he and Elizabeth had not had a child. They were well along in years. They had lived their entire married lives with the disappointment of not having children. And now they were past the childbearing years, for decades, I imagine. Undoubtedly, when they tried to conceive, every month when her cycle came, they were disappointed. They did not have a child. But as long as she continued having her cycle, there was hope that next month she might conceive. But those cycles had long since passed, along with the hope of ever having a child. And now this shocking news from Gabriel, that she would have a child, and his name would be John, and he would become a, a great man of God. I can't even begin to imagine how overwhelming it must have been for Zechariah to hear this news. It was so shocking, as a matter of fact, that it was almost impossible for Zechariah to believe. And we see that in his response. He says, how can this, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Now, those words, when at face value, they don't seem maybe too unrealistic given the magnitude of what he just heard, an angel speaking to him for the first time in his life. But there was more underneath, and God saw what was more underneath. I think that doubt that he had was displeasing to God. And so Gabriel tells Zechariah that he wouldn't be able to speak until the child was born. And so Zechariah comes out, mute, not able to say one word. He can't utter a thing, nothing. But he makes motions and signs, and people realize that, that he's seen a vision. So Zechariah then goes home. Short time later, Elizabeth, his wife, becomes pregnant. And for the first five months of her pregnancy, uh, Elizabeth remained in seclusion. Now, you can imagine what she must have been thinking during that time. She was too old to have a child. Now she's bearing a child, and every morning she wakes up with this uh, child growing inside her, and certain she must have, uh, it must have felt like her, uh, a dream come true. And the word began to spread in the community. Uh, first, people would have been shocked to hear that Zechariah saw an angel, had a vision. And second, the word that Elizabeth, beyond her age, is, is now a child, the buzz would have been all over the community. Now, this news undoubtedly reached the ears of Mary because Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. And so we read in Luke chapter 1 and verse 26 that six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel comes back to earth and now appears to Mary. Mary's from Nazareth, a backwater town. 
in the region of Galilee. Just hardly a blip on the map. Tiny burg. Pam and I were there in November just not too many weeks ago. It's amazing to be where these events took place. We're going to take another trip this next year. It's going to be amazing. So after Mary receives the news that, that uh, she would give birth to Jesus, Luke says this, Mary got ready, hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. So Mary, now that she hears this news, goes to see Elizabeth, who she knows is pregnant as well. Now, Luke makes this sound like this is a walk in the park. You know, Mary's just going to walk across the street and go see Elizabeth. Uh Uh-uh, it was an 80-mile walk. And Mary, probably by this time, has morning sickness. Okay, an 80-mile walk on dusty roads from Nazareth down to where Elizabeth was. Very difficult trip. But this trip would prepare Mary because nine months later, she would follow that same road now with Joseph to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Now, Mary went to Judea because she undoubtedly had heard about the miracle child that Elizabeth had, and now that Mary was carrying this second miracle child, she needed someone, she wanted somebody to process with. So that's where we pick up in Luke chapter 1, verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the berry leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Now, it's clear from this passage, isn't it, that Elizabeth knew that Mary was carrying the Messiah. She says, why am I so favored? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Now, we're not told how Elizabeth knew this, that Mary was carrying the the Messiah, the Christ child. Maybe the angel Gabriel had appeared to her another time. Maybe she learned this in a dream. We don't know how she knew this. The scriptures don't teach us, but clearly she knows that Mary's carrying the Christ child. And when Mary enters the house, Elizabeth knows and the The child leaps in her womb. Luke goes on to tell us that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. Imagine the conversations they had during those three months. Both women are carrying miracle child, children. During that time, they must have talked endlessly, trying to process this. Now, keep in mind that Mary is a a young adolescent, between 12 and 14 years of age. Elizabeth, her older cousin, is probably over 50 years of age. And so the older cousin talking, dialoguing, conversing with the younger cousin, they prayed, they processed together the staggering things that had been told of them and the children that they would would be bearing. Mary's response to this news as, as a virgin that she is carrying this child, it's recorded for us. Mary's response to the angel is recorded for us in the book of Luke. Now, This is often referred to as the Magnificat. That's a term in Latin. It means magnify. And it comes from the first phrase that Mary says in her response. She says, my soul glorifies or my soul magnifies the Lord. And this Christmas Eve, I'd like us for a few moments to focus on just the first lines of Mary's response to this amazing news that she was carrying the Christ child. My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Now, this is the question that I want all of us to think about this Christmas. How do you respond when your dreams are rudely interrupted by something unexpected that God allows to happen. How do you respond when the dreams and expectations that you have for your life 
are rudely interrupted by something unexpected that God allows into your life. Mary shows us here in her response that she glorifies God, she magnifies God when this very unexpected event comes crashing into her life. Now, Mary grew up in an environment where the greatest aspiration she had for her life was to get married and have children. In the culture, in the time, that was really the only vision that she would have had for her life. Today, women have many more choices, many more options. But in that time, the only thing she had ever dreamt about was to find a young man, get married, and have children. She was betrothed to a fine young man named Joseph. Her dreams were about to be fulfilled. They were undoubtedly planning the wedding, thinking about the future that they would have together. And then one day, very, very, very unexpectedly, God interrupts their carefully laid plans with the news that Mary was pregnant as a virgin. Now, as far as we know, that had never before happened in history. And as far as we know, it's never happened since. Today, I want to talk about this unexpected curveball that came crashing into Mary's life. Today, we know it as a miracle. We call it the virgin birth. But at the time... People just snickered at Mary. For the rest of her life, they whispered behind Mary's back that she had been promiscuous. I'm sure Mary stopped trying to explain that she was pregnant as a virgin. People would have blown her off. They would have thought she was crazy or naughty or both. Mary wasn't naive. She knew this was the future that she would face. And I'm certain that was a big part of the conversation that she had with Elizabeth over those months. What am I going to tell people? What am I going to tell my parents? What am I going to tell Joseph? How am I going to explain this? Those questions swirling in her mind, and she responds the way she does so beautifully to the Lord. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Now, sometimes when I look out over a, our church, I think about the shattered dreams and the unexpected twists and turns that I know have happened in our lives. And I get overwhelmed on occasion. The truth is, I have never met anyone in my entire life whose life turned out exactly like they would have hoped when they were teenagers. Some of us dreamed about having kids one day, but it never happened. We tried and we tried and we tried, but it never happened. And the ache may yet still be there. But even in all your pain, and even all your, your unmet expectations, I want to ask you, along with Mary, can you say, Lord, I will trust you even when I don't understand, and I'll rejoice even when my life is so different than I had imagined. Years ago, I had a friend who was a Christian counselor. All day long, he met with clients, mostly from dysfunctional families and all kinds of pain. And my friend, as a Christian counselor, was never able to have a child with his wife. One day he came to me with tears in his eyes and he said, Steve, I know I would be a better parent than most of the clients that come to see me. Why wouldn't God allow me to be a parent when these other people that are so messed up have kids? I didn't have an answer for him. And I still don't. For most of us, life just doesn't work out like we had planned. But can we, like, like Mary, lift our hands in a metaphorical way or even in a literal way and surrender, say, Lord, I'll trust you even when I don't understand. I'll rejoice even when my life is so different than I would have imagined. Some of us always dreamed about getting married, and you waited, and you waited, and you waited and no one's come along. 
You long for companionship. You long for love. You long for the life that you, you always dreamed you'd have. But it hasn't happened yet. And it hurts. It really, really hurts. I wish I had a way to fix it. For me, one of the most difficult things about being a pastor is knowing the hurt that people carry and not being able to fix those hurts. But even in your singleness and even in the unmet expectations of your life, along with Mary, can you lift your hands and surrender and your hearts in surrender? Lord, I'll trust you even when I don't understand. I'll rejoice even when my life is so different than I would have imagined. Some of us have been married and it didn't work out like we imagined. Instead of happily ever after, there were arguments, there were tears, abuse perhaps, and pain. It wasn't supposed to be like that. How could something so beautiful end up so painful? You tried to make it work. But nothing you did made any difference. And one day, you gave up, or your spouse gave up, and the papers were filed. It felt like you died while you were still living. Some days you, you hurt so bad you couldn't even get out of bed. Some days you might have looked up at the ceiling and almost cursed God. God, why did my marriage turn out so crappy? When other people don't give a rip about you, seem so happy. I don't have an answer for those questions, friends. And I can't fix it, even though with all my heart, I wish I could. But I want to ask you this. With your shattered dreams and unmet expectations, will you still this Christmas raise your face and surrender and your hands and surrender to God and say, Lord, I'll trust you even when I don't understand. And I'll rejoice even when the life that you've given me is so different than I would have imagined. As I said a moment ago, sometimes I'm overwhelmed when I look out over our church family and think about all the hurt and the disappointment and the shattered dreams. For you, maybe it's a health issue. It came in out of left field. You never expected it in a thousand years. Or maybe it was the time your best friend turned his or her back on you. Never in a million years did you see it coming. And it rocked your world. Or maybe it was a financial dream that went up in smoke. You planned well. You did everything you thought was right, but it all blew up. It disappeared overnight. Years ago, a friend of mine lost $1 million in a real estate deal in Colorado. He told me one day, one day to the next, it was all gone. $1 million, just like that. There was nothing he could do to get it back. He tried to do everything right. Whatever your shattered dream may be, this Christmas... Would you raise your hands and surrender and simply say, God, I'll trust you even when I don't understand, and I'll rejoice even when my life is so different than I would have imagined. Some of us have adult children who have not uh, have not done in life what we would have expected. They made seriously poor decisions. We ache for for our adult children. We, we, we tried to teach them well. We gave them the life that we would have dreamed about having as a, as a young child. And not a day goes by when you don't dream and pray something better for your adult child. We loved our children, raised them the best we could, and their decisions led them in places that are nightmares. I know that pain never completely goes away, but even in the midst of that pain and even in the midst of Whatever you're wrestling with inside as a parent of adult children, would you still raise your hands and surrender? Lord, I will trust you even when I don't understand. And I'll rejoice even when my life is so different than I had imagined. Now, in Luke chapter 1, it's very clear that the, the Lord wants us to see a contrast between Zechariah and Elizabeth, or Zechariah and Mary. Now, both were met by the angel Gabriel. Both received the staggering news that into their family would be born a child. Zachariah is too old to have a baby, and Mary 
is to untouched. She's a virgin. In both cases, the baby was an unexpected gift, a, a, a blessed gift, surely, but completely unexpected. It rocked their worlds. But Zechariah responded with doubt and questions, while Mary responded with faith and surrender. Metaphorically feel, uh, speaking, Zechariah arched his back while Mary raised her hands. Zechariah said, I don't understand, but Mary said, I don't need to understand. So how about you? What have you done with your unmet expectations and your dreams that were shattered? Have you raised your back and arched it, or have you raised your hands in surrender to the Lord? Or perhaps your world hasn't been turned upside down yet. If that hasn't happened to you yet, I have news for you this Christmas. At some point it will. At some point it will. As I said earlier, I've never met anyone whose life turns out exactly like we would have scripted it when we were younger. Life happens. We live in a broken world. We make mistakes. God intervenes and does something unexpected. Mary was a young adolescent, again, between 12 and 14 years of age. But despite her tender age, she had an incredible ability to surrender to God. And this Christmas, maybe with tears, maybe not, whatever your unexpected shattered dream may be this Christmas, would you along with Mary be able to say, Lord, I'll trust you even though I don't understand and I'll rejoice even when my life is turned out so different than I would have imagined.